Welcome again. In this session, we're going to be reading Mark chapter 12. And this is a very interesting chapter. We're going to go through a lot of the different uh, teachings of Jesus here. The parable of the talents, paying tax to Caesar, uh, marriage at the resurrection, the greatest commandment, uh, whose son is the Messiah? Hmm, good question. Warning against the teachers of the law and the widow's offering. So let's get right into this. This is Mark chapter 12, verse 1. He began to speak to them in parables. This is Jesus speaking. A man planted a vineyard, put a hedge around it, dug a pit for the wine press, built a tower, rented it out to a farmer and went into another country. When it was time, he sent a servant to the farmer to get from the farmer his share of the fruit of the vineyard. They took him, beat him, sent him away, empty. Again, he sent another servant servant to them, and they threw stones at him and wounded him in the head. They sent him away shamefully treated. Again, he sent another, and they killed him, and many others, beating some and killing some. Therefore, still having one, I mean, this farmer must have been pretty distraught here. He, he, he lost all of his servants, and now he, the, only thing, the only one he's got left now is his own son. Therefore, still having one, this reminds me of uh, Hebrews, actually, where it says that in former times past, God sent prophets to speak to us, but now he speaks to us through his son. Okay, so in the former times past, God sent the servants, but then at last he sent his only son. Therefore, still having won his beloved son, he sent him last to them, saying, They will respect my son. But those farmers said among themselves, This is the heir. Come, let's kill him, and the inheritance will be ours. They took him, killed him, and cast him out of the vineyard. What therefore will the Lord of the vineyard do? He will come and destroy the farmers and give the vineyard to others. Haven't you read this scripture? The stone which the builders rejected has made the head of the corner, was made the head of the corner. This was from the Lord, and it is marvelous in our eyes. And that's Psalm 118, verses 22 to 23. Verse 12. They tried to seize him, but they feared the multitude. For they perceived that he spoke a parable against them. Indeed, he did. They left him and went away. Some, they, they sent some of the Pharisees and the Herodians to him, that they might trap him with his words. They're trying to trap him. When they had come, they asked him, Teacher? Rabbi? We know that you are honest. Here we go with the sweet talk. We know this. Here we go with the mushy, mushy, kissy, kissy, sweet talk, the nice stuff. Oh, Rabbi, we know that you're honest and, and you don't defer to anyone, for you aren't partial to anyone. Oh, wow. So that's the praise that they're giving Jesus here. But truly, teach the way of God. Is it lawful to pay taxes to Caesar or not? Shall we give or shall we not give? But he, knowing their hypocrisy, said to them, Why do you test me? Bring me a denarius that I may see it. So he brought it. He said to them, Whose is this image and inscription? They, they said to him, Caesar's. Jesus said to them, Render to Caesar's the things that are Caesar's and to God the things that are God's. They marveled greatly at him. Some Sadducees who say that there is no resurrection, came to him. Now, let me just stop here for a second. Understand that of the different sects, you know, we know about the Pharisees, we know about the Sadducees, okay? The Pharisees believed in all of the Tanakh, the Torah, the Nevi'im, the Ketuvim, and also the oral law, okay? The, the Jewish traditional, you know, the traditions, the, uh, the Talmud kind of thing, okay? They believed in all that kind of stuff. Whereas the Sadducees were strictly uh, Torah, okay? Because you see, if you look at the history of the scriptures, when the Torah was given, it was given publicly by God to Moshe, to Moses. 
And no one asked the question. No one doubted that it was from God. No one would dare even say it's not from God because they all saw it, that what it was from God. In fact, the voice of God, they chose, they said that they couldn't bear no more. They said, Moses, you're going to have to go and, and talk to God for us. You know, we can't bear this no longer. So they all knew the Torah right from the very beginning was so-called canonized. As it came down, it was so-called canonized. Whereas the prophets and the Ketuvim, the writings would be like the historical writings and the other writings and such, you know, Psalms as well. They weren't canonized, so-called canonized until much, much later. Okay. So the Sadducees were, were, were just focused on the Torah, saying the Torah is the only one that's really the word of God. Whereas the prophets and the, and the, and the Ketuvim, the scriptures, other than the Torah, uh, are not so much the word of God. So um, they said there's no resurrection. And the reason why they didn't believe in the resurrection or this kind of stuff, because they did not see it in the Torah. They did not see that in the Torah. I mean, trust me, the Torah does teach resurrection, but they just did not see it. So, so uh, let's go back to verse 18 again. Some Sadducees who say there is no resurrection came to him. They asked him, saying, Rabbi or teacher, Moshe wrote to us, if a man's brother dies and leaves a wife behind him and leaves no children, that his brother should take his wife and raise up offspring for his brother. Now you see, it's very, very, very important for them to have children, to have a posterity, to have an inheritance, okay? It's very, very important here. So in, so much important that it says in the Torah that if a man has a wife and he doesn't have children and he dies, that man's brother, of course, if he has a brother, is supposed to take his wife, okay? Now, what if that man's brother is already married? Well, again, this is another case of having multiple wives, and that's that's just the way it is in the, in, in the Holy Scriptures. But that brother would take the wife of his deceased brother and 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 uh, and try to raise children with 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 that woman for his brother more or less okay so the sadducees came with a question verse 20 uh, he they came with a, they painted a picture for jesus okay they said there were seven brothers the first one took a wife dying left no offspring the second took her and died leaving no children behind him the third likewise, and the seven, and the seven took her and left no children. Last of all, the woman also died. Okay? So all seven brothers had this wife, still no children, and then the wife died after all of them. Verse 23. In the resurrection, now why would they be asking about the re resurrection? Because they don't believe in the resurrection anyway, you see? They're just kind of mocking Jesus, or they're just they're just kind of testing him. They don't really believe in the question they're asking. It's not an honest question. They don't believe in the resurrection, so why would they ask? But they asked anyway. In the resurrection, when they arise, when they rise, whose wife will she be of them? For the seven had her as wife. So they're trying to make a point. They're trying to make Jesus look like, you know, they're trying to discredit him in a way. Okay? They're trying to catch him. Verse 24, Jesus answered them, Isn't this because you are mistaken? Not knowing the scriptures, nor the power of God. Very important, my dear you know, uh, friends, is to know the scriptures and to know the power of God. Very important. Jesus rebuked the Sadducees for not knowing the, the scriptures or the power of God. Isn't, isn't this because you are mistaken? Not knowing the scriptures nor the power of God. For when they will rise from the dead, they will neither marry nor are given in marriage, but they are like the angels in heaven. But about the, the dead that they are raised, haven't you read in the book of Moshe? about the bush, 
how God spoke to him saying, I am the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. This is Exodus chapter 3, verse 6. He is not the God of the dead, but of the living. You are therefore badly mistaken. Notice that Jesus used Torah against these Torah-only people. Verse 28, one of the scribes came and heard them questioning together and knowing that he had questioned them well, or excuse me, knowing that he had answered them well, asked him, which commandment is the greatest of all? Okay, now, there's some Christians that believe that if you break one commandment, you break them all. And I know they're taking James chapter 2 out of context. They don't understand that James is talking in generality, vague generalities here about whether you're a, law, you're a lawbreaker or not a lawbreaker. They're not, they take that way out of context and, and they take it to the extreme. You know, a lot of Christians say, well, it's no use following the Torah because you break one, you break them all. You break one uh, law, you, you're guilty of breaking them all. Like one is equal to all. Really? How is it that if you break one of the least of the commandments, how is it that if you break one of the commandments, you break them all? I guess, I guess if you obey one, just one, you must obey them all too, right? I mean, if you obey one, you are counted as obeying all. It makes sense if you say if you, if you, if you, uh, don't obey one law, if you miss it, if you sin in regards to one of the, of the commandments, then it's like breaking them all. So then if you obey one of the commandments, it's like obeying all. You know what I'm saying? It's just ridiculous. Again, it's James chapter 2 taken to the extreme and taken out of context. Misinterpretation. One commandment of the Torah is not equal to all. They're not all on the same level. They're not all equal. Not all commandments are equal. There are greater commandments. There are lesser commandments. There are greater sins. There are lesser sins. Not every sin deserves death according to the, to the Torah. Not every sin is an abomination according to the Torah. Okay, some sins... Just barely, they don't get much pun, much punishment at all compared to death or being called an abomination, if you know what I mean. So there are greatest, the greater sins, which are the one, the sins that violate the greatest commandments, and there are the lesser sins, which are the sins that violate the lesser commandments. So there are lesser commandments, and there are greater the greater commandments. It's not true that if you if you break one of the lesser commandments, you you are breaking all of it. You, you even break the greatest commandment too. That's not true. You understand? I know some of you, you know, the lights are starting to come on in your head. You understand? There are different levels. There are different categories. There are different higher. There's a hierarchy of commandments you know of the torah there's a hierarchy of different commandments different different um uh, what would you call it uh different degrees of sin different degrees of righteousness okay so when this scribe he perceived that jesus was very wise and what he was spe speaking was very very you know just absolutely amazing so he asked him what a, a you know a good question which commandment is the greatest out of all 613 commandments, which one is the greatest? Jesus answered. Now, he could have said, they're all on the same. They're all like, they're all the same. They're all on the same level. You break one, you break them all. That's what he could have said. He could have said, oh, there's no, no one greater than another. You break one, you break them all. That's not what he said. He said, the greatest is, and he's quoting from Deuteronomy chapter 6, the greatest is, Hear, Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and with all your strength. This is the first commandment. The second is like this. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. And that is in Leviticus 19, 18. There is no other commandment greater than these. 
Okay. Notice that Jesus never separates the greatest from the second greatest, the first from the second. When he talks about the first, he's always talking about the second because you can't separate it. If you love God, you really, really love God, you'll love others, especially those who represent God. Okay. If you love Jesus, you'll love others. Okay. Especially those who represent Jesus. Okay. Verse 32, the scribe said to him, truly teacher, you have, you have said well that he is one and there is no other but he, no other but he, and to love him with all your heart, with all your understanding, with all your soul, and with all your strength, and to love your neighbor as, as, as himself is more important than all whole burnt offerings and sacrifices. Mm, isn't that quite the statement? When Jesus saw that he answered wisely, he said to him, you are not far from God's kingdom. Wow. First of all, you might think that this scribe, which is supposed to be one of the, actually like, almost like a leader in Israel, because the, scribe is the, the scribes are the, one, the ones that actually deliver the, the scriptures to, you know, to the people. They're the ones that actually write out the, the Torah and, and the, they copy the Torah and copy all of the prophets and everything. Uh, you would think that all of the scribes would be going to heaven. They would think that all the scribes would be right with God because they are, I mean, they're working firsthand, you know, right in the front lines of the word of God, so to speak. But Jesus said, you are not far from God's kingdom. I wonder if the scribe was uh, offended at that because the scribe might have you know, been so proud of being a scribe, thinking that he would have been not only in God's kingdom, but one of the greatest of God's kingdoms, in, in, in God's kingdom. But Jesus said, um, you are not far from God's kingdom. Let's read on. No one dared ask him a question after that. Jesus responded, as he taught in the temple, how is it that the scribes say that the Mashiach, the Messiah, the Christ, is the son of David. And even today, may I add, that the Jewish people say that the Mashiach, the Messiah, is the son of David. Verse 36. For David himself said in the Holy Spirit, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool of your feet. And that is found in uh, Psalm 110, verse 1. Therefore, David himself calls him Lord. So how can he be his son? Isn't that a good question? Very, very good question. The common people heard him gladly in his teaching. He said to them, Beware of the scribes who like to walk in long robes and get greetings in the marketplaces. They like the attention. They like people to look at them and to say hello to them. And the best seats in the synagogues. They like to sit in the best places in their houses of worship. And the best places at feasts. They like to have the best of everything, don't they? They like to have the, you know, the reserved seats. Those who devour widows' houses and for a pretense make long prayers. They, they do it hypocritically. These will receive greater condemnation. And again, I will say this. There are greater sins and there are lesser sins. Greater sins, greater sins are breaking the greater commandments. The lesser sins are breaking the lesser commandments. The greater sins receive greater condemnation. The fact that Jesus said that there is such a thing as a greater condemnation, it absolutely tells you that there is such a thing as a lesser condemnation. If there's a greater, there's a lesser. So not all condemnations are the same either. Verse 41. Yeshua sat down opposite the treasury, and that would be in the temple, and saw how the multitude cast money into the treasury. So he's watching people give. Many who were rich cast, cast in much. A poor widow came and she cast in two small brass coins. Now it says here in my notes, literally lepta, or widow's mites. Lepta are very small brass coins worth about, worth half a quadrants each, which is a quarter of a copper Assyrian. 
Lepta are worth less than 1% of an agricultural worker's daily wages. So let's, you know, 1% of a day's wages. Think about that. Mm, that is very, very small amount, okay? It is like pennies, okay? Which equal to, uh, it says here, which equal a quadrant's coin, okay? Again, a, a quadrant's coin is a coin worth about one sixty-fourth of a denarius. A, uh, a denarius is about one day's wages for an agricultural laborer. He called, himself, he called his disciples to himself and he said to them, Most certainly I tell you, this poor widow gave more than all those who are giving into the treasury. For they gave out of their abundance, but she, out of poverty, gave all that she had to live on. So that concludes our reading of Mark chapter 12. And so once again, may God bless you with you know, richly with revelation and, and wisdom beyond all your peers. And uh, may your eyes be open to see and may your ears be open to hear uh, the word of the Lord and the voice of the Lord to perceive the riches that are in these scriptures. Thanks again for watching and God bless.